Welcome to Shine Today, I'm Andrew Curtis, and we are living in unprecedented times. Have you heard this before? Have you ever lived in unprecedented times? How does this affect us as Christians and the wider church as well? What does it mean to be a church leader at times like this? These are questions I'm sure many of us have wondered, but who would we ask at a moment like this? Well, I'm very pleased to say today we've been joined by Jonathan Dove. He's the Executive Director of Auckland Church Leaders, and he does join us today. Hello, Jonathan. Kia ora, Andrew. Thanks for being here. I mean, there's so much that we could talk about here too, and I'd love to know, I guess, to begin with, let's set a bit of uh, a foundation here of the role that you're in. How did this come about? What is the, uh, the body of Auckland Church Leaders designed to achieve? Yes, Auckland Church Leaders has been around for, for, for quite a while and uh, they threw me the leadership at the end of 2019, so just before the pandemic. Oh, lucky you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but there's a real heart among our leaders throughout the city. So our bishops, our denominational leaders, mm. our pastors of larger churches, just to really work together. And you know, we often have this cliche, you know, we, we're better together. But we're actually trying to sit back and go, you know, what does it actually look like to, to step into that space? So we've identified areas like, like prayer. How, how can we pray together? Mm. Uh, how can we uh, inspire serving together in, in our city? How can we gather pastors in different groups around the city who are really isolated right now? Um, how can we support pastors through things like, like coaching, uh, inspire church planting groups, you know, areas like that. So there's, there's different initiatives that we're working on right now. Mm. And so how many churches and church leaders are a part of this in total? So um, our, our group has about 44 people who are the denominational leaders, bishops or pastors of large churches. And then obviously we, we are meant to represent the wider uh, church of Tamaki Makoto. Mm. And so with that many different denominations coming together, um, from an outside perspective looking in, I'm imagining what some of those meetings are like with the different backgrounds we have and maybe varying interpretations of things. And yet in all of this, I know that there's a, a huge desire to build unity amongst church leaders as well. So, I mean, how is this possible? How are we building towards that goal at a, at a time like we've just experienced? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think we, we need to begin with the, the fact that Jesus prayed for unity. Mm. Uh, you know, on the very night that he's arrested, that he's gonna be killed, you know, that the thing on, on his heart is about unity. Mm. So, you know, praying that we would be one, just mm. as Father and Son are one. So it's certainly possible for us to have unity, but uh, it's, it's not uniformity. Yeah. It doesn't mean we have to agree on styles of music and style of church leadership and size of church congregation, th things like that. That, that. You know, those have very, you know, various different ways of doing things, thinking about things throughout yeah. history. Yeah. But I think Jesus even showed how, how unity is possible amidst diversity. Mm. If you think about just the 12 disciples he had. Mm. You know, he has uh, Simon the Zealot, uh, you know, within his group, you know, who would have been um, anti, you know, Rome at the time. Uh, and then you have Matthew the tax collector who's like on Rome's payroll. Yeah, right. right. So, so the way Jesus could, could actually bring such diversity amidst a, a unity in his own team. Yeah. I think shows us again, you know, unity is possible amidst diversity. So, I mean, how do we define unity then? Because I think that's a, a great point that you make there and maybe an area where we go down the wrong path, where we're thinking, okay, we're united if we're all saying the same thing mm. at the same time. How are you defining it within the church leaders? And I guess, how would you measure if you're making progress towards that or maybe if you're slipping away from it? Yes, I think at the heart of unity is what we have in common. Mm. And what we have in common is that if we know Jesus, we're actually part of the same family. Mm. Uh, it, it doesn't mean though that there's not tensions. I, I think the whole history of the church is, is full of these tribes that we often have. Uh, I, I think of the way Paul wrote to, um, in the New Testament letter of, of First Corinthians, I was a church in these like tribes and camps, you know, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, you know, I follow Jesus, you know, the, the spiritual people. Yeah. And he said, you know, it's, it's actually, we need to identify that, that we are brothers and sisters and Jesus, this is what keeps us together. In mm -hmm. fact, um, what I love thinking about is if you take the same six letters of the word united, um, you can actually take those same six letters and, and go untied. Mm. And, and the difference between united and untied is really where you place the I. And, and that's often the problem, it's, it's the I, the ego, yeah. that gets in the way of unity. And unity can happen as we highlight the unity of the body of Christ, the unity of the family that we're part of. Sure, I think a lot of pastors watching right now just got a sermon illustration for this <laughs> Sunday, so there's your value right there. Um, but why don't we talk about then, uh, I think you, you alluded to something too that I'm fascinated to unpack, and that is this idea of 
even the, on a relational level, what that can look like. Because I think sometimes we have a belief about unity being everything is peace and quiet all the time. You know, we're always getting along, everything's kind of fine. Uh, and yet, you know, we can have conflict and see it in a, in a healthy way. How do we have discussions about things that we disagree with where I could disagree with you and yet we could walk away afterwards and say, we might have disagreed, but, you know, Jonathan's still a good guy, Andrew's still a good guy, we're still serving the same ultimate vision. Is that something we need to work on, maybe how we have these, these healthy conflicts or healthy disagreements? Yeah, that this, this is essential for us, particularly in a culture right now where we have got so used to if people don't agree with me, you know, we, we cancel somebody out. True, yeah. And, and I think we have to be okay with welcoming difference. Mm. Uh, difference of, often does lead to conflict, mm. and then we tend to stress out and think something's going wrong. I think as, as, as I read the New Testament, I, I see conflict happening all the time, but it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm. Uh, I, I think particularly in Acts 15, you have this beautiful story of the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, and and they they actually differ over whether John Mark should be with them on this on this mission trip, mm. and both of them have good reasons for it. And, and and what I love about it is is the writer of Acts, Luke, doesn't doesn't say well Paul is better than Par but Barnabas or Barnabas got it right. He just he just presents the facts here. Mm. There was tension, yeah. and, and and it was a dispute that they couldn't just sort out immediately. And I think that reminds me that we have to be okay with that. Uh, I think so often we, we want to fix everything immediately. Mm. And I think sometimes things just take longer. Yeah, I, I love that thought. And in fact, you reminded me as you say that too, one of the things that I've reflected on lately is how even the conflicts that we have, it's not always about the thing that we're conflicting about right now. It might be the other stuff that's going on in our world that, you know, that's maybe filled our tank up to, you know, right up to the brim. And then it's the one thing that somebody else says or does, they catch the frustration, the disappointment, whatever we might be dealing with. And so I'm curious to know, in terms of more of a, I guess, a state of the state of the nation, uh, or at least state of the city question, um, how do you feel we are doing within our churches in terms of this time that has been massively stressful for so many, but of course our, our churches and church leaders too, how, how are we coping? Are we coping? But I, I guess first first thing is to acknowledge the last two or three years have right. been incredibly difficult. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think churches have done a remarkable job of, yeah. of leading in this space, you know, through you know online church or the way they've responded and pastoral care. So so first, I think the church has done an amazing job. Mm. But uh, leaders and and people all over the place, we're we're just exhausted right now. I, I think emotionally, we, we have no reserves left. Mm. Physically, we're just exhausted. I mean, financially now, cost of living's going up. So I think we just need to take some time to reflect on where we are, mm. but also realizing it just seems to be in these moments where we feel at the very end of ourselves that, um, you know, I know it's cliche, but it seems to that, that God does his very best work in oh, us sure. in yeah. these moments. So I, I have a high hope of what we can do in this season and what we can learn in this season. But mm. we actually do need to take the time to listen, reflect, pause and, and review, yeah, right where we are. Yeah, because it makes me think too about that dy dynamic of what we need from our church leaders and, and what they need from us as well. And I think that's a healthy dynamic uh, for us to remember that sometimes it's very easy. I suppose you would hear this a lot when we're speaking to church leaders. When people say, why doesn't the church X, Y, Z, uh, it's kind of shorthand for why isn't my pastor X, Y, Z, right? And yet at the same time, our pastors need things from us as well. And with everyone feeling depleted right now, I mean, what is something that pastors or church leaders do need from us or maybe that we can keep in mind when we are having those conversations or looking to the needs that are around us and asking, are we meeting these? Are we being an effective representative of Christ in our community? Yeah, I think of the story of, of Elijah, um, and I, I think if we could almost just camp on that story for a moment. Mm. Um, you know, if you think of the story where he's just had this amazing, been, been part of this amazing work of God up yep. on Mount Carmel, and, uh, you know, that there's the prophets of, of, of Baal, and, uh, you know, and, and the, the fire, you know, comes down from heaven, and, and you know, Elijah wins this, this um, kind of contest of the, of yeah. the gods. Immediately after that, uh, Elijah is just completely burnt out. Mm. So he's, he's physically spent, he, he's exhausted, he, he's got no emotional reserves. Financially, it's just been a drought, so he's got nothing. Mm. And uh, spiritually, you know, he's, he's exhausted too. And, and I think vocationally, he, he doesn't want to be a prophet anymore. Mm. Uh, relationally, he feels like he's the only one. So in all of these different measures we might have of well-being, he, he loses in all of them. Mm. 
But I love the way God comes around that. And perhaps this is where we can learn how to respond to pastors is, is actually seeing what God does. Mm. God gives them time. He's a good example, by the yeah. way. Yeah, <laughs> I, think example. He is. I like that. Yeah, you know, he gives them time. He he provides some food. Yeah, encourages them to sleep. Mm. Uh, reminds them that it's it's okay to be where he is. Yeah, starts to just give them that time and space mm. to heal. Mm. And and the pastors I speak to all around the city, I haven't met anybody who who is doing really well. Mm. You know, I think yeah. all of us are just depleted. Yeah. We're exhausted. There's a lot of Elijah syndrome, I think, in all of us right now. Mm. So I think if, if people could just be empathetic towards their pastors, towards their leaders, towards each other, mm. and, and realize actually we just need to be patient, yeah. calm with each other, understanding, yeah. reminding yeah. each other, it's, it's, it's okay to take some time to heal. Yeah. It's actually amazing too, isn't it? How spiritual we can be about our needs when sometimes, you know, God is as spiritual as prescribing a nap and food. And we're like, no, but sure I need to pray and fast more and things like that. And he's like, no, no, these needs are real as well, right? Exactly. In fact, one person, Richard Black, that I was speaking to around this, he, he talks about, um, I guess even our emotions being like a credit card, that, yeah. that, that during the, the last three years, we have used our credit card and, and drawn on that and, and we've needed to. And, and that's okay where mm. we step in and we go from change to change to change. And, and that takes a toll on us emotionally. Mm. So our credit card, you know, debt has gone up. Obviously how debt works is you can't just keep adding to <laughs> the debt. At some stage you have to repay that. Sure. And so we need to take some time to replenish yeah. and pay off that debt to build up some credit again mm. in order to respond to, to this moment in front of us. Yeah, yeah. And um, I guess partly related to this too, we've talked about the, the change of internal circumstances that people have gone through. Uh, but if we track back, say, even further than COVID, let's say go over the last 10 years, maybe even 20 years, depending on how long people have been in the family of faith, we have seen a difference in the, the place that the church holds in our society as well. Uh, you know, some would say for better or for worse. And that's, I feel, going to play a role on, on pastors' lives as well. Obviously, you'll speak with uh, more direct knowledge of that than I would. Uh, but how do you feel about that in terms of where we're placed as a church, maybe particularly within Auckland, as a, as I guess, as a, as a body of Christ reaching our community now? Has public sentiment really shifted that much towards the church now? Or are there avenues that are closed that were once open or maybe open that were once closed? Mm, great question. I, I think you certainly... Uh, what's uh, obvious in wider society is people have moved from being perhaps apathetic towards the church mm. to perhaps being more hostile mm. towards the church. But I think the greatest challenge facing the church, as the late Francis Schaeffer said, is, is always to present unchanging truth to a changing world. Mm. So the church has been in this place before. Mm. And so all the New Testament epistles were written in the context when people were hostile towards yeah. Jesus, towards the church. So we actually have a lot to draw from in this space. So yes, things have changed, but we need to again reflect on where we are and uh, identify actually the gospel is still just as powerful, mm. just as good, mm. just as relevant to wider society. It's just perhaps the reception to that has changed significantly. <laughs> I mean, I wonder if it's sometimes a bit of a, uh, maybe a cultural hangover for want of a better term of being in a position where for a long time you could appeal to church values to a random person in the street. And maybe I have to go back more than 20 years to do this, maybe not. And the other person would at least understand what you're appealing to and, and state their position one way or the other. Whereas these days, maybe you make an appeal to a Christian value and you're just as likely for the other person to say, well, I don't believe in that value. They might use stronger words than that. Uh, and then you've got a whole different conversation to have. And maybe we're also kind of coming to terms with that, maybe grieving the place that we felt like we once held and wishing we could go back to the good old days. Yes, I mean, it's great, great comments to, to have there. I, I, think, um, I think what I'd like to say is when church has come from, a, I guess, a power position, you know, being, mm. being the majority, we haven't always done well historically <laughs> when True. we've had that power. Yeah. I think the church tends to flourish most when mm. we're actually coming from being more foreigners and exiles, to mm. use the language of the New Testament. Yeah. And because uh, this is when we realize actually um, our power is in Jesus. Our posture should always be one of humility, always one of serving. Mm. And so the question before us really is, is how do we serve our wider city? Mm. How, how do we point people to Jesus, but in a way that's not from power, mm. but by showing the beauty of who Jesus is, 
Because if you think about how Jesus did this, he they had this amazing way of making everybody feel welcome yeah. and included, and yet also pointing to something very different, you know, challenging us about the way we think about life, or the way we think around sexuality, the way we think around values or, mm. or money or whatever it might be, very different values. Mm. And yet he, he had this way of, of drawing people to him. And, and I think that was because of his gentleness, his humility, his way of welcoming people. Mm. So I think we can learn a lot from Jesus in this space. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. And I mean, you alluded to a couple of things there that are maybe kind of hot button topics. And, you know, again, maybe there is wisdom for us to, to find in this. In fact, I'm certain there is. When we're talking about things like, say, money or sexuality, for example, uh, two really big topics um, that can often be quite controversial in the culture that we live in, what ways can we maybe ad address those or um, is it something that maybe we're getting bogged down in that's distracting us from, you know, the, the main message? How do we how do we look at those things today? Yeah, great question. I, it was really interesting. I was um, chatting with our Auckland Church Leaders Group. We had a um, Mayor Goff uh, with us recently and mm. uh, we were celebrating some of the um, things he stepped into and yep. reflecting with him around, um, you know, his, his recent term. Uh, and then the mayor stopped in the middle of a whole range of things and then looked at us as church leaders and said, you know, as church leaders, you need to do a much better job <laughs> of challenging us in society with, with the values you hold to. Hmm. Now, he wasn't talking about family values. I think he was talking about values such as generosity, hmm. values of, of service, of, of sacrifice. And he, he's calling us as Christians to step into that space that where there is often a vacuum and in wider society. And, mm. and I, I think we need to actually pay attention to that yeah. uh, be, because as, as you said, you know, politics has become so much part of, of focus groups and trying to respond to public opinion. Mm. We're actually called to challenge wider society where it needs to be mm. uh, and invite people to a different way of life. And, and that's what Jesus does so well again. Well, you reminded me too how, you know, when people, you know, that, uh, those immortal words where people say, you know, people keep saying, no, it's a few months until the harvest. And he said, no, people are ready now. And when it comes to some of the things that maybe we see as signs that people are not ready, that, that those words from Phil Goff that might have even just been a kind of a throwaway comment suggest that there is a, a readiness. Um, and perhaps, you know, we've doubled down on things that are distracting from the core part of our, our message as well. Is, is that fair? I, I think so. Again, when you look at Jesus, he, he, he brings people with him and challenges uh, where they are, mm. but in a way that people don't, are unrepelled by him, yeah. they're still drawn to this, this different way of life. And, and I think that the reality is the church will sometimes be out of sync with wider society. And that's okay, uh, as long as we're actually still being welcome, welcoming and, and inclusive and we're, we're still pointing to Jesus and, and what Jesus has to say about things that, that will often challenge us and wider society and, and challenge our way of life. Mm. Now you spoke as well about how Jesus was able to bring in those who felt like they were on the, on the outside of society. And it's an interesting situation within a lot of families right now too. And I know this will be replicated again and again through churches, not just in Auckland, but maybe even around the world where uh, our children are also experiencing a lot of, of stress and, and pressure right now um, and can often feel isolated or ostracized for all sorts of different reasons. It could be uh, because of their, uh, their values or could be say things like gender confusion at the moment as well. These are, are big things that are going on right now. Um, are we still learning how to provide support to you know, families or children who are in those places? Or how are we kind of progressing with what seems to be the very you know, 2022 issues of the day? I think the way that we raise up the next generation, which is absolutely vital that, that we do that well, I, I think the success comes through in, in the probably two areas that have probably always been the same too. Uh, one is the, the modelling of parents. Mm. Uh, you know, how we talk about Jesus, if, if we have a contagious love for Jesus ourselves, mm. uh, that comes through in all of life. You know, as a pastor of, of my church, we often talk about um, the need to delete the line that so often exists between faith and life and faith and home and, mm, you know, yeah. faith in everything we do. And, and our kids need to see this wholeness and holistic way of, of being that Jesus actually affects everything we do. So if they see an integrity in that space, they're more likely to take, take on the way of Jesus themselves. Mm. Second thing I'd like to say is that the models where we're uh, the next gen really does embrace faith and, and take on 
um, that way of Jesus tends to happen often in that kind of gap year stage in life. Mm -hmm. And so as people come out of school and into university where there's often a significant drop off rate Mm -hmm. uh, or sometime during those university years, having a year that's a gap year, that's actually providing a great foundation in life uh, where where, um, young people are able to engage in a significant mission trip and uh, actually raise questions that they have around faith and have some really good experiences, providing a foundation for all of life. Mm. Uh, That seems to be a model that really steers people well into the future. So we've been talking about a lot of issues right now and overall the theme of change has been a big part of this. And so when we're thinking about our churches themselves, how is it that we can provide this environment that is still supportive and relevant uh, when so many things are changing? And again, we have so many different styles of church as well. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I would almost pick up that word relevant uh, and, and just almost um, not want to push on it too hard, but I think so much of our church culture in the past 20, 30 years has been trying to design a church around relevancy. Mm. And, and I wonder actually if we need to move away from that per se, because I think there's going to be moments in life when we're out of sync in wider society. Mm. And it doesn't mean we want to be irrelevant. We still want to speak the language that people use. But I think we also need to uh, step back and think, how do I be distinctive? Mm. How do we take on this way of Jesus? And how do we um, become more open to even other ways of doing church beyond what we might be seeing right now? And I think what, what many leaders are talking about is it's, it's like we're in this, this liminal space people often call between where we have been and where one day we will be. And we really need to reflect on what does it look like to follow Jesus in, in this culture, in this context moving forward. So I, I think there's a lot of discussion to still have mm. uh, right in this space. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. And I mean, again, I'm glad that this is this is happening, that we have a, uh, an organization like the Auckland Church Leaders who are coming together to, to do these sorts of things. Um, it would feel remiss if I didn't ask, you know, how can we be praying for you as, as your congregation members and just as your partners in ministry as well? What can we be praying for? Uh, certainly all the time for, for, for wisdom, for, for health, for, for protection. Uh, we, we want the church to thrive throughout Auckland, Tamaki Makaurau. Uh, you know, we believe that the gospel is the power of God for a flourishing city. Mm. And so that's, that's what we all want to be doing. And so let's be praying for, for leaders to be raised up to work for the peace and prosperity of, of our city. Mm. Well, look, it's been an amazing chat with you today. So I want to thank you for coming in. And I know we've been wrestling with some big topics for the day too. So uh, Jonathan Dove, the Executive Director of Auckland Church Leaders, I'm so glad that you could make the time to speak with us today. And um, thank you for joining us as well. Hopefully this can inform what you're praying for and the ways in which we are reaching our community through our churches as well.